faster GPUs, more RAM, and many other things come together to form a more powerful next generation console. But just as important as all of those things are features and also hardware efficiency. For example, let's talk about variable rate shading, which is part and parcel of DirectX 12 Ultimate and of course the Xbox Series S and Xbox Series X. To keep things simple for this video, think of shading as the act of drawing in a scene. Characters, geometry, whatever else needs to be of course filled in each and every frame. And the faster the frame rate you target, the less time you have. So if you're targeting 60 FPS, you've got 16.67 uh, milliseconds to draw each frame. And if you're targeting 30 FPS, this doubles to 33.3 milliseconds. Variable rate shading then allows developers the option of shading a scene at different rates depending what's going on, either with coarser or finer detail. For example, let's say an object is heavily influenced with motion blur. Does it really need as much detail as, say, your character's face if they're close to the camera, or maybe your car in a racing game? The answer is, of course, no. And so this is critical because it allows you to save performance, which can be used to either increase detail in areas which matter, or the reverse, you can just target higher frame rates. DirectX 12 Ultimate is used in both the Xbox Series X, Xbox Series S, as well as the PC, with the features being essentially a match between the PC and Xbox hardware. This allows developers to easily port code from the PC to the Xbox or vice versa. This is going to be critical for Microsoft's plans moving forward, because obviously Microsoft are not just focused on the Xbox as a console, but rather the Xbox as an ecosystem. DirectX 12 Ultimate also brings with it features such as mesh shaders and uh, hardware-based ray tracing. The API, of course, is what the game engine basically uses to communicate to the hardware itself, speaking to the GPU driver. I'd also like to plug, I put out another video a while ago, why DirectX 12 Ultimate changes Xbox and PC gaming. So if you're interested in a broader overview of DX12 Ultimate, I suggest you give that a watch. I'll of course link it in the description of this video. To clear up though a few points of confusion, variable rate shading is not a feature which is specific to DirectX 12 Ultimate. Other APIs can support variable rate shading and have done so for some time. For example, we have that support in Vulkan, and NVIDIA supported variable rate shading with their Turing architecture with Wolfenstein. It was called NVIDIA Adaptive Shading, and this, of course, brings us to the other logical point, and that is that the Xbox implementation or the desktop implementation of RDNA 2 is not the only way to implement uh, variable rate shading. NVIDIA, for example, have variable rate shading for the Ampere line of GPUs, as well as Turing-based GPUs, RTX 30 and RTX 20 respectively. Intel can support it with Intel XE, and so on and so on. I also want to make a quick note that the PlayStation 5 handles geometry processing and actually shading of a scene a lot different to Microsoft's ecosystem. It does not use DirectX in any way, shape, or form, Sony have their own APIs. Therefore, even the hardware of the PS5 is rather different thanks to the presence of the geometry engine. I've tackled this in several other videos in the past, but honestly, I think any discussion of this at length in this video would do a disservice to Microsoft's work for their implementation of uh, VRS and DirectX 12 Ultimate. I want this video to focus on Microsoft's work with variable rate shading being implemented into Gears 5. The team, the coalition, did a really good write-up on this, and so I wanted to kind of delve into this, not just from the Xbox perspective, but also the PC. So we're going to see how variable rate shading affects the performance of the RDNA 2 architecture, NVIDIA's Ampere architecture, and also how it will impact the Xbox as well. With that said, let's jump into it. VRS is definitely an incredibly important feature on consoles. And Microsoft's work with DirectX 12 Ultimate's implementation cannot be underestimated. Recently, they detailed the work of enhancing the game engine for Gears 5 with VRS, and it's pretty interesting. With the Hive Busters update, additional graphics modes were also made available for the PC version of the game, including contact shadows and screen space global illumination, alongside VRS Tier 2. SSGI and Contact Shadows were actually first part of the upgrade for Gears 5 on the Xbox Series, but have now been backported to the PC. 
Screen Space Global Illumination is essentially software-based ray tracing, i.e. on both the PC or Xbox platforms, it does not use dedicated ray tracing hardware to do these calculations. By default, the setting on the PC, as well as the Xbox, uses 8 rays per pixel. Though you can also set it on the PC to use 4, 16 or 32. It's actually pretty demanding, as you can see in this benchmark with the RTX 3080 and native 4K. Again, the ray tracing unit of the RTX 3080 is not being used here, as again, it's being run in software. Tier 1 and Tier 2 VRS are actually pretty similar to one another in their basic concept anyway. The real difference comes down to the optimization and granularity. Basically, Tier 1 VRS works by allowing you to specify a shading rate per draw. Tier 2, though, changes this to a screen space texture. The idea is that the coarser details go where it makes sense, or, to put it another way, in areas of the image which are undergoing depth of field, motion blur, contribute less to the uh, overall quality of the image, say a background object, they get shaded at lower rates, and vice versa for important uh, areas of detail, say a character's face or your car in a racing game. There are limitations with VRS though. For example, the lower the resolution, the less impact VRS will have in a scene in terms of percentage gain in performance. So a 4K resolution target has a greater impact than 1440p, which in turn will have a greater impact than 1080p. According to Microsoft, anything less than 1080p is probably not worth it. There's just not enough pixels. In theory, this could mean that the Xbox Series X does actually benefit more than the Xbox Series S because of the lower resolution target of the lower spec hardware, with the Series S generally targeting either 1080p or 1440p. The second limitation of VRS is that it's entirely solving GPU-related issues and not CPU. So if your console or PC are struggling in terms of a CPU workload, then VRS is going to make no difference. It'll just actually highlight the CPU limitation all the more. As the GPU has less work to do, as it has less to shade, while the CPU is still struggling to feed it data. A compute shader is used to generate a VRS texture, and then it's used in the next frame of animation, with the color of edges being used to determine how VRS is applied. It's here that the quality settings of VRS can be adjusted. With the PC version of Gears 5, you can disable VRS, or prefer balanced, performance, or finally, quality. Gears 5 then uses VRS Tier 2, and a second VRS pass is used, it's known as a conservative pass, for things which don't go so well with course, for example, screen space reflections. What's really impressive about all of this is how fast the VRS texture generation is done. It's ultra quick. Remember how we established that 16.6 .6 milliseconds is how long it takes for a frame to render if we're targeting an average of 60. This VRS texture generation is accomplished in under 0.1 milliseconds for Gears 5 on both next generation Xbox consoles, as well as PC GPUs, which are capable of VRS. For the Xbox Series S and X, there's also dynamic resolution in play. This can be used on the PC version of Gears 5 too. The game simply cannot maintain 90 FPS at native 4K when everything is set to max, with both contact shadows and screen space global illumination being particularly taxing. So with the FPS target set, the game engine realizes it's going to take more than 11.1 milliseconds per frame, it would need to hit 90 FPS, and adjusts the resolution accordingly. And here we can see the results of the PC version of Gears 5 with different internal resolution targets of 4K, 1800p, and finally 1600p to give you insight in how lower resolution affects performance. Again, we're using the RTX 3080 for these performance numbers and we're using the in-game resolution scaling to achieve this. The Series X and S use the same technique, but with the in-game resolution, it's often considerably less than 4K, but upsampled. Gears 5 also uses Unreal Engine, so post-processing runs at full resolution thanks to UE's temporal upscaling, even if the native resolution has dropped in a specific frame. This leads to another complexity when running variable rate shading, though. 
with a compute shader basically resizing the VRS texture according to the new resolution of the frame. According to the folks over at the Coalition, this is done in about 0.02 milliseconds on both Series X and Series S. VRS does a pass with coarse shading, then a dynamic resolution decides if scaling is needed to maintain frame time based on the drawing of the previous frame. Microsoft says that with this work of VRS, an average of a 10% higher dynamic resolution is achieved. Or, in some cases, you don't even need to utilize uh, upsampling at all. So, what about testing then? Well, we've decided to run the results on two systems. An AMD Radeon RX 6800 XT, thanks to AMD for providing the card. A Ryzen 9 5950X, and we also plonk this onto an MSI B550 MEG motherboard, thanks to MSI, by the way, for providing the motherboard, and PCIe for NVMe SSD, thanks to XPG for the RAM and SSD. The second system we used an Intel 10900K provided by them, as well as an Asus ROG Maximus Extreme motherboard. The GPU being tested here is a thousand edition RTX 3080, thanks to NVIDIA for the graphics card. Let's start things out with synthetic tests with 3D Mark's variable rate shading. This benchmark is specifically designed to test VRS, and the results here could be described as a best case scenario, to the point where they're definitely an unrealistic portrayal of how VRS will affect titles in the real world. But still, the performance results are rather interesting. Next is Gears 5. Again, Gears 5 is a very demanding title on the GPU, particularly with contact shadows and the like enabled. The Xbox version, which we'll look at in a moment, also benefits from dynamic resolution. This allows the GPU of the Xbox to do less work, but the PC version we're testing here, I've disabled it for our tests. Gears 5 on the PC does look amazing, and it's hard to deny that the game doesn't heavily benefit from usage of variable rate shading on both AMD and Nvidia's architectures. Variable rate shading at lower resolutions barely makes any difference here at all in terms of percentage gain, and this trend is something we'll definitely see to continue across RDNA 2 and Ampere, as well as different games. Gears Tactics has three settings for VRS, disabled, on, and performance. The Radeon RX 6800 XT lacked the performance option here, so we're testing it with just on and off, with the RTX 3080 having all three available. As we discussed earlier, the Coalition's original work on implementing variable rate shading in Gears Tactics had served well for their later work with VRS Tier 2. Finally, on to the Xbox Series X tests, and Gears 5 is a nice showcase for what Microsoft can squeeze out of the Series X, despite it being very early in the console's life cycle. Of course, the team essentially took the base PC game running at the highest settings, made a few tweaks, and then added features such as contact shadows, which again were upgraded for the PC as well. You probably have guessed that the few comparisons you've seen here shows that the Series X version stacks up pretty damn well against the PC builds, and in our frame rate tests, the game mostly sticks to 60 FPS lock during single player. There are a few instances during heavy loading that this isn't the case. Long story short though, this is probably just the legacy of being built on older hardware. It doesn't seem to be GPU or CPU related, particularly given the fact that the resolution can drop as needed, and it does quite frequently below the native 4K. It's not uncommon to see 1800p or even lower when scenes are heavier. Fortunately, because post-processing does run at native, as we were discussing earlier, it's actually still pretty damn good looking. It's a significant step over what we've seen with the last generation Xbox One. So then, we're left with a lot of intriguing possibilities going forward, and you can already see, even with this early work, the performance of speed ups or variable rate shading. But of course, it is still very early in the console generation, and I see a lot of reports that things such as native resolution are so important. I still find this method of thinking so baffling. I tackled this more extensively in another video called Native Resolution is Dead, but to my mind anyway, it's not just, well, the native resolution or the amount of pixels in a scene. Instead, it should be the quality of pixels. 
With upsampling, for example, we see a lower resolution image being upsampled to a higher resolution image, which is then output. So, for example, you could have an image being rendered internally at 1440p and then upsampled to 4K. NVIDIA have been doing really stellar work with DLSS uh, as a great example, and I again went over this much more extensively. To my mind, if the native eye cannot tell the difference between a native resolution image and an upsampled one, but the upsampled one has way better image quality because you can use that additional GPU grunt to either increase the frame rate or just the quality of the pixels, better ray tracing, better shading, whatever. To me, that's an obvious win. At the moment, I'm really anticipating AMD releasing their super resolution technology, which allows basically upsampling on RDNA 2 class GPUs. AMD have confirmed that this will work on Xbox Series X and S, the PlayStation 5, and of course, RDNA 2 for the desktop. It basically uses lower precision operations, I believe, on the GPU, but so far, I haven't seen any actual images as to how well it uh, accomplishes this, at least in comparison to DLSS. But getting back to the topic itself, variable rate shading and all of the other graphics technology, for example, hardware-based ray tracing, is still very early in how developers are figuring out how to best use it. I suspect that over the next couple of years, we're going to see drastic performance increases across the board. Even with hardware-based ray tracing, as developers figure out the best pipeline and how to squeeze the most out of the hardware. With that said, thank you very much for checking out the video. If you've enjoyed it, well, you know what to do. You like, share, of course, and also comment on the video because it helps that sweet, sweet, sweet YouTube engagement. And of course, definitely uh, click the bell icon after you've subscribed as well because YouTube land. You can also find a written version of this, which is found in the video description. So if you do prefer the written word, well, you know what to do. With all of that said, thank you very much for watching. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.